All right. Okay, let's go. Uh, I think I can say it. Loading. There. Oh, go into presentation mode. There we go. There, I think that works. Can everyone see my presentation okay? Looks good to me. Awesome, thank you. All right, so like Elke said, my name is Heather, and just a little bit of my background. I'm the Wildlife Outreach Specialist here at Project Wildlife. I have been with the organization for going on five, I believe, years now. Um, I've worked on both the domestic side as well as now the wildlife side. I do have a background in zoology with a concentration on conservation of native species that I got at Colorado State University. So a lot of similar wildlife in Colorado to California. And my biggest passion is definitely intake diversion, like Elke said, keeping wild animals wild, making sure they're out there doing the wonderful job that they do to keep San Diego so beautiful. So today we're just going to talk a little bit about Project Wildlife and when to intervene, when the wild animals that we do see out in the wild need our help, and then how we can help them as a community. So Project Wildlife is one of the largest wildlife rehabilitation centers in the entire country. We average about 10 to 13,000 patients each year, and those patients are made up of over 320 different species of animals. A couple of years back, we actually set a new record for ourselves and we took in over 15,000 patients. I think it ended up being 15,126. So that was a really big year for us. And this year we are projected to take in about 10 to 11,000 total. So unlike other businesses who like to see their numbers go up, Project Wildlife, we love to see our numbers go down. And I don't know about you all, but I do like to say that our numbers are going down due to my intake diversion education efforts. But it's also just because, you know, there's so many different things happening in the ecosystems, but intake diversion is definitely a huge thing that we want to work on at Project Wildlife. So, like I said, we take in 10 to 13,000 patients and 320 different species. So why do we get so many animals? San Diego is located in one of the most biodiverse regions in the world. Um, San Diego is considered a biodiversity hotspot, which to be considered a biodiversity hotspot, at least 70% of the land needs to be developed on, and there needs to be at least 200 to different plant and animal species. And San Diego definitely blows that out of the water. We also have beautiful weather year round and a large variety of different habitats that both people and wildlife are able to flourish in. So San Diego has many, many different types of ecosystems. Within San Diego County, we have six different types. We have the chaparral, the ocean, we have grasslands, mountains, coastal sage scrub, and the desert. So people always say that San Diego's county is one of the few places that you can go see snow in the mountains, the desert, and the ocean all in one day. And so just a brief breakdown of San Diego wildlife. Like I said, we're a biodiversity hotspot. So we have about 500 different bird species, 122 different species of mammals, 91 of those being terrestrial and about 31 being aquatic. And we have 94 different reptile and amphibian species. So what animals does Project Wildlife help? This is just to name a few. We help a bunch of different wild animals, but we help raptors, a lot of different baby songbirds, opossums, squirrels, raccoons, coyotes, black bears, and bobcats. So again, that's just to name a few, but those are some of my favorite species that we help out. And like I said, we are one of the largest wildlife rehabilitation centers in the country. And at this point in time, we do have two facilities. We have our Pilar and Chuck Body Wildlife Center, which is located at 5433 Gaines Street, right across the street from the Humane Society. And at this location, we're going to mainly be focusing our rehabilitation efforts on the songbirds, the small mammals like rabbits, squirrels, gophers, the raptors. So here we usually have the younger raptors, 
Um, so baby owls, hawks, um, eagles, and uh, falcons. And we also do rabies vectors here as well. So bats, skunks, and raccoons are gonna be the rabies vectors that we are rehabilitating at the Body Wildlife Center. Our other location is our Ramona Wildlife Center, which is located at 18740 Highland Valley Road up in Ramona. And this is gonna be our location where we're taking care of the apex predators, more rabies vectors, and the older raptors that are ready to start practicing their flight muscles, going in those flight cages and getting prepared for release. So up at our Ramona Wildlife Center, we're also piloting a mountain lion rehabilitation program with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, not a lot is well known about rehabilitating these animals. They're notoriously difficult to catch when they're injured. And so we went to CDFW and let them know that we want to learn more about what we can do to help mountain lions and spread that knowledge with other rehab centers across the country. And we are one of four wildlife uh, rehabilitation facilities in California permitted to rehabilitate bears. The other three, I believe, are in Northern California. So we're the main resource for any black bears that need rehabilitating in all of Southern California. So at Project Wildlife, our goal is to rescue, rehabilitate, and release every sick, injured, and orphaned wild animal that comes into our care. So our goal is always, always to release them back out into the wild. And there are many different reasons that wildlife becomes sick or injured, but a lot of those reasons are due to human impacts. So at Project Wildlife, some of the most common reasons we're seeing patients come in can include being caught by dogs or, cat, or cats. When we let our pets out into the backyard, there might be a desert cottontail nest or a fledgling on the ground hopping around and our pets are naturally going to kind of go towards those and have that predator prey behavior. So we have our pets that can be causing issues with wildlife. Hit by cars, trimming nests out of trees or other nest or den disturbances poisoning or trapping the wild animals, collisions with windows, entanglements in trash or fishing equipment. And one of the more common reasons is accidental kidnapping by us. So one, once again, that's the main point of this presentation is how we can avoid all of these situations as well as knowing when we do need to intervene when we see a possible baby animal on the ground and that sort of thing. So just a brief overview of the rehabilitation process at Project Wildlife. The patients will be brought to us at our intake window and patients can be brought to us by members of the public. They can be brought to us by our humane law enforcement officers or other animal control officers from different agencies and police departments. And it's not just limited to that, we've gotten wild animals from the city, from SDG&E, we get, we get them from everyone. Just wild animals can find themselves into some sticky situations and so they can be brought to us and we take them in. Um, medical will examine and develop a care plan based on what's going on with the patient. During that initial exam, all of our patients get their temperature taken, they get a weight, they'll usually see if the patient needs pain medication or subcutaneous uh, subcutaneous fluids in case they're dehydrated at all. So our medical team definitely wants to make sure that they're stable and good to go during that initial examination. Based on what our medical team finds, they will um, decide if the patient gets to continue through care at our facility. So maybe they'll stay at body for a while, stay in our critical holding area for medical to keep an eye on them. Maybe they'll get transferred up to Ramona because they're already ready to be put into a flight cage or in other circumstances, they might be put into satellite care. <clears throat> so satellite care, just briefly, is a volunteer program that we have at Project Wildlife where we have volunteers that work under our permits and they're able to rehabilitate patients in their homes. Um, they follow our protocol and our, and our guidelines for rehabilitation. And we have satellite teams for all different sorts of species. We have a bat team, a raccoon team, songbird, hummingbird. Um, so you name it, except for like the black bears and the mountain lions, we, you, we have a satellite team for almost every species that we're able to rehabilitate at Project Wildlife. And then finally, 
when the final okay is given by our medical team, the animal is getting about well, finding food well in their enclosure, the patient is going to be released. Um, we release our patients within three to five miles of where they were found. We do this for a few different reasons. We want them to make sure that they're able to find food, water, and shelter. We want them to be familiar with the surrounding area. Um, so we want them to be close to where they were found because we know they had been there before. Um, also, we don't want to possibly intrude on any possible territories of other animals. And one of my favorite reasons that we've seen quite a few times is if they have any sort of family unit or partners back out in the wild, we want to make sure that they're able to reunite with those animals as well. A few years back, just as a quick example, we had a red tail hawk that came to us from Mission Trails Regional Park and it had been a window strike. And so she came to Project Wildlife and we had to make sure she was okay. She could see, she didn't have any brain injury or anything like that. Um, but after about two weeks, she was good to be released. And when we released her back into Mission Trails Regional Park, her partner actually immediately found her. And right after the release, they immediately started doing a courtship dance in the sky and it was beautiful and awesome. And so, that's what we truly love to see at Project Wildlife is those animals getting back out where they belong and reuniting with those family members they have back out in the wild. And there a question. Yeah. And I, and I would answer this in chat, but I want to make sure with the bird stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Can animals be brought to any of our campuses since it's a long drive from North County to Project Wildlife? And where do we take animals after? So that's a great question. At this point in time, we do encourage um, people to bring the wildlife to either our Ramona campus or our body um, campus, just because we do have the avian influenza going around. And so we want to make sure that we're limiting the contamination as much as possible. So up at our North County campuses, they are able to take in non-avian influenza susceptible species, but birds like raptors and corvids and waterfowl. Um, we do ask that those go directly to a project wildlife facility, just so we don't want the ducks that might be at Oceanside or Escondido to possibly be infected by a wild species. So just for biosecurity measures, we do ask that the wildlife are brought straight to project wildlife. Um, but if that's not a possibility, then you can definitely drop them off at Oceanside and Escondido and we will get them as soon as possible. And for after hours, we have closed our after hours intake room. However, we have multiple vet clinics um, throughout the county that will take in wildlife for us and hold on to them overnight. And there's also some instructions on our website on how you can contain wildlife overnight if you're comfortable and then bring them to Project Wildlife the next day. And a little bit later in the presentation, I do also go over how to um, contain and keep wildlife safe for brief periods of time. And won't our, our humane officers pick up as well at times? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in times of emergency where the animal needs immediate assistance, our humane law enforcement officers definitely come out and help out with wildlife situations and they're trained for wildlife handling and all that good stuff as well. Is that did that cover the question? Yeah. And then I put a link into about the drop off. Awesome. Perfect. And so um, though most of our patients are in need of care, um, occasionally animals are brought to us when it's not necessary. So now we're going to do a little bit of a scenario practice. I think there's about seven scenarios that we'll go through and we're just going to see how well all of you know whether the animals are in need of help or should be left alone and what you should do if you see these animals out in the wild. So as I go through a scenario, feel free to put in the chat what you think that you would do in this situation and then we'll go over the answers all together. All right, so scenario one, this is a very common scenario because rabbits are one of the few wild animals that reproduce all year long. They don't take a break like other animals do. So this happens no matter what time of year it is. You come across a cottontail rabbit nest in the lawn of your front yard with babies that are clearly too small to be on their own. So that would be their eyes aren't open. They don't have fur all over their bodies. And at first you leave the babies alone, but after a few hours, you still see that mom has not returned to visit the nest. 
So what do you all think you should do in this situation? Go ahead and put it in the chat and then Elke, I believe, will read out a few of your responses and we'll see if you guys are right. So Becky says to leave it alone. Okay. Leave it alone, Susan. And if you um, can't get into the chat, feel free to unmute yourself too. Vicky says, leave it alone. All right, we have uh, four, leave it alone. Put sticks around the nest to see if mom returns within 12 hours from Yvonne. Awesome, yeah. So the first thing to do is wait. Um, cottontail moms only spend 20 minutes per day with at their nest. They'll go 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at the night, and they are only there to feed their babies. They're not going to want to hang around the nest because that could possibly attract predators to the nest. So they're going to be gone as much as possible throughout the day. So just because you see mom doesn't mean the babies are orphaned. And if you want to check to make sure the babies are being cared for, here's what you can do. Like Yvonne said, put an X of sticks over the nest or sprinkle flour around the nest and then return a full day later. So we want to make sure we're giving mama a full day to come back and check on her babies. So if the sticks have been moved or you see footsteps in the flower and the babies are still there, leave them alone. Mom is caring for her babies and she is their best chance at surviving into adulthood. However, if you put the excess sticks in the sprinkle of flour and they have not been moved, there's no footsteps in the flour, at that point you can assume that the babies have been orphaned and need your help so you can bring them to Project Wildlife where we can give them the care that they need. All right, scenario two. So your cat walks into your house and has a bird in her mouth. You successfully take the bird from your cat and assess him for any wounds. There doesn't seem to appear to be any injuries and the bird seems large enough to be an adult and completely on his own and independent. What should you do? We should have that music. Turn it to the yard, put the bird outside. At some point, you might start flying around your house. <laughs> Anybody else? Leave him alone, see if he can fly, see if the bird can fly away. What's our answer, Heather? All right. So this was kind of a tricky one because this bird should definitely be brought to Project Wildlife. So any animal that your pets, especially cats, catch in their mouths can have injuries that are not immediately obvious and can be serious. Especially with birds, they can have a broken bone somewhere that's not visible. They might have some internal bruising, etc. And the biggest thing is cats have a lot of bacteria in their mouths. And so if there is an injury or a small puncture somewhere, that wound can become infected. So we do want to make sure any animal that is cat caught or dog caught is brought to Project Wildlife. All these poor little birdies. And um, they should be brought for an exam and any necessary treatment. All right, so scenario three. The dog. Sorry? If it's a dog? Dogs, dog, uh, animals caught by dogs should be brought to Project Wildlife as well. Any pet caught animal should definitely be brought to Project Wildlife just because we want to make sure there's no internal injuries. And if they don't have any obvious external injuries, it's definitely possible something could still be happening internally. Just having something, in, being in something's mouth can definitely cause some sort of internal or external trauma. So we always just want to make sure and be on the side of caution. And then Heather, so say we bring it in, we assess nothing is wrong with the bird, then the bird will go back to the neighborhood and be re-released, correct? Yep, 
within three to five miles of where they were found and we get as close to the exact location it was found as possible. The only time we kind of go a little bit further than the exact location is if they were found somewhere not exactly ideal or safe for the wild animal. So for the mama opossum that was found on the side of the road, we're not gonna release her back on the side of the road. We might go a mile and a half away to a local park or something that is a little safer for her. Thank you. All right. Um, scenario three, you see a baby bird hopping around on the sidewalk near some bushes and he's in no immediate danger. He has all his feathers and is active and alert, but doesn't seem to be able to fly. When you walk up to him, another bird flies at you from the surrounding trees and the baby hops away from you. What should you do? Susan jumps in, leave it alone before you even finish the question. <laughs> leave it alone here and then. Leave it alone. It sounds like we have a few leave it alone. Leave and, it alone. and that's exactly right. So you're going to want to leave the bird alone. So this bird is a fledgling, meaning he's learning how to fly. They learn how to fly from the ground up and can spend several days on the ground building up their flight muscles. Um, and by several days, that can be up to two weeks for some species. However, there is a caveat for leaving the bird alone. Um, hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are the only caveat. Hummingbirds should never be found on the ground. Um, they are the only, or not the only, but they're one of the few bird species that will learn how to fly directly from the nest. So if you ever find a young hummingbird on the ground, that is the caveat that can be brought to Project Wildlife or put back in the nest. And the bird who flew at you when you approached the fledgling was likely mom or dad. The parents continue to look after their young even when they've left the nest and while they're learning how to fly. An example of this would be great horned owls. Great horned owls stay with their parents five months after they fledged, just gaining that confidence, getting ready to go off into the world on their own. So they actually will not leave the parents completely until it is time for the next breeding season for the great horned owls. Okay, so you come across a baby bird at the base of a tree and this bird has no feathers, the eyes are closed, and there's no apparent injuries, but he's chirping for food, limited in movement, and clearly too young to be alone. What should you do? One is hard for people, I think. So one to spring in. Leave it, but watch for a parent to come feed it. Hang it in a nearby tree if you can't reach the nest. Look around for mom and dad. Put it back in nest if possible. If not, bring it in. Yeah, so. Or bring in. Awesome. So you can help. So this baby bird is what's called a nestling. It should definitely still be in the nest being cared for by the parents. If you can locate the nest in any of the nearby trees and you're able to reach it, you can absolutely place the baby back in the nest. And a quick fun fact, it's not true that a mother bird will reject her babies if you touch them. Birds in general have a pretty poor sense of smell and will not be able to tell that the baby has been handled by a human. However, I do always recommend if you're still a little nervous about it, you really don't want the baby to be rejected, you can also always take a pair of gardening gloves or like nitrile gloves and rub it in grass and dirt and mulch and whatever smells like the outdoors and then pick the baby up and put them back in the nest if that gives you a little bit more peace of mind as well. And there, you might not know the answer to this. So I think many of us were surprised. I don't know if you heard of that white baby bison that was touched by a human um, and they had to euthanize the baby because the herd would no longer accept it. Is that why they had to do that? And is that a thing? Um, so I've heard about this briefly. I didn't read into it too much, but with bison and other ungulates, so like deer, 
and other like goats and cows and those sort of animals, they do have a fairly good sense of smell. So wild ungulates do tend to be a little more ready to reject their young. The one we always tell people that the only baby animal you really need to worry about touching with your bare hands and the mom rejecting it is deer fawn. Um, so it's definitely possible with the bison, but again, I didn't read into it too much, but um, I do feel that it, it could be a possibility. Thank you. So if you see a nest, but you can't reach it, or you don't see a nest at all, you can always make your own nest using a berry basket or any other container with drainage holes. You just really wanna make sure that it has drainage holes in it because if it rains, we don't want the nest to be filled with water. And then you wanna line it with tissues and securely place it as high as you can in the tree. Again, I do just wanna reiterate that it's important to line it with tissues and not like a little washcloth or something because those little loops in the fabric, their little um, nails can get caught on it or mom and dad's nails can get caught on it as well. So we just wanna make sure that the, uh, the man-made nest has something inside of it that mom and dad won't get stuck to. You could also use hay. I've always offered people that if you wanna do something a little more natural looking, you can use like a little bit of hay as well and some grass. And then you just wanna securely place it as high as you can in the tree, the higher up the better. Mom and dad will feel safer going to the nests. Babies will be more protected from predators. And from there, the baby will do the rest of the work. They'll sit there and they'll cry and yell for food. So the parents will be able to locate and continue feeding him as well as any other babies that they have around. Scenario five, you see an opossum who appears to be dead in your yard but has no obvious signs of injury. They're curled up with their mouth open, unresponsive, and have a foul odor. What do y'all think you should do? Uh, animal control. Leave alone. Leave them alone. They could be scared of you and be dead. <laughs> so quite a few leave alone. So you wanna wait. So when threatened, an opossum's main defense is to play dead. Um, their body will go into shock. This is an involuntary response. So if an opossum gets scared, they don't make the active decision to fall over and play dead. It is their body saying, we're in survival mode, pass out. Um, their heart rate will drop to two beats per minute to really convince whatever predator is going after them that they're deceased. They can make themselves smell dead. They'll emit a really foul odor from them. And this can last anywhere from five minutes all the way up to five hours. It just depends on how threatened that they feel. So just because an opossum looks like they're dead doesn't mean they are, they could be pretending. And the best thing to do is leave them alone. However, if the opossum is in any danger during this state, an example, they might be near a street or they might be in your backyard where your dog might get to them, you can always use a thick towel and gently move them to a safe space nearby where they won't be disturbed and will be able to wake up in their own time and then move along. And opossums definitely mean you no harm. They eat rattlesnakes, ticks, fallen fruit, rotten fruit that are falling from your trees and their body temperature is so low that they cannot contract or pass on rabies. And they also don't contract any of the other diseases that can negatively impact our pets like distemper or parvo or anything like that. So they're a really great animal and we love them a lot at Project Wildlife. We call them the OBs. Heather, well, um, since I just experienced this, um, yeah. there was what I we immediately thought was a dead opossum. That was how he was lying down too. Um, but it was in an area that only people are at on a limited basis. So would he play dead for days if nobody's around? No, so not for days. They would do it for about five hours maximum. 
So if they're there longer than five hours, usually the, at that point, we recommend you can definitely bring them into Project Wildlife. We can confirm that they are actually deceased. And especially if it's a female and she is deceased, we do want to make sure we're checking that pouch to see if she has any babies. And then can they bite you if they're in shock? Um, I always say anything with teeth can bite. When wild animals feel threatened or scared, they may result to biting. So if you are ever going to handle an opossum, I just highly recommend making sure you use a very thick towel, always wear gloves, and definitely make sure the towel's covering the opossum's face before you contain them. Um, opossums are not the type of animal where their first instinct is going to be to bite, but um, we, we've definitely had situations in the past where they do. So I, I definitely would err on the side of caution and just make sure you're using some good personal protective equipment and keeping yourself safe first and foremost. Any other questions at this nope. time? So scenario six, a small squirrel who appears to be a baby approaches you and begins following you around, maybe even trying to climb onto you. You don't have anything that might be attracting him to you like food, and he doesn't appear to be injured, but will not stop trying to get near to you. What should you do? I got nothing. Nothing? Nothing in my head. Bring to Project Wildlife. Becky says, question mark, leave alone. So this is a tricky one because there's no sign of injury. Um, you know, they're they're on their own. They're not too worried about being sick or injured, but this animal should definitely be brought to Project Wildlife. Any wild animal that actively seeks out people without exhibiting normal defense or fearful behavior could potentially need help, whether it's because they're a hungry orphan or have been illegally raised by humans. We never want habituated wildlife to be out in the wild. I always tell people just because you love wild animals and think it's really fun that they come up to you or have a raccoon in your yard or an opossum, et cetera, that doesn't mean that the people around you feel the same way and those people may do some adverse things to try to get the wildlife to go away. So we always just want to make sure we're keeping our wild friends safe. So if they're showing any signs of habituation, they can come to Project Wildlife. Um, so at Project Wildlife, we would give them an exam, see if there's any underlying issue behind it, whether it be like it says, hungry orphan, just so desperate for food, or there might be a neurological issue. And we also give them time to wild up. We wild them up. We put them with con specifics, kind of let them teach each other how to be a wild animal and survive on their own. No, dang dodo videos don't help. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, okay, so scenario seven, you see a mother duck walking in your local park with several small ducklings. Other people are walking up to the ducks to take pictures and try to feed them. The mom gets scared and flies away, leaving the babies behind because they are unable to fly yet. What should you do? Leave them. Leave them alone. you should talk about feeding ducks as well. Watch yes. these ducks from afar and wait until the mother comes back, try to get the people away, feed yeah. them. Yeah, exactly. So wait, when mother ducks get scared, they may first flee the scene, but they could potentially return for their young. So before assuming these ducklings are orphaned and in need of help, give mom a chance to reunite with her babies. You want to tell them how many ducklings we've received this year? Like oh. a number. I don't even know if you remember or if you know the number off the top of your head. 
off the top of my head, I don't know the exact number, but I know it's probably at least around like three to four hundred. Many of them probably didn't need to come to us. Okay. Probably all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, so the best way to give mom a chance to return is to give the duckling space and to leave them alone. So mom will likely not have gone far, but she will not return to her young if there are still people near them. So watch from a distance to see if mom comes back. I always recommend about 30 feet. We just really want mom to feel safe and able to come back to her babies. And if the ducklings begin to scatter, you know, their baby wild animals are just going to start running amok. Um, you can place them in a box or a laundry basket or another container to keep them safe until mom returns. If the mom has not returned within two hours at that point, it is, it is safe to assume that the ducklings have unfortunately been abandoned and can be brought to Project Wildlife for continued care. And to prevent further conflicts like, conflicts like this, always remember to leave wildlife alone, tell the people around you to leave wildlife alone. And fun fact, bread is very bad for ducks. It can cause their wings to develop improperly and prevent them from being able to fly, making them quite literally a sitting duck. And that is not what we want. <laughs> we want them to be able to fly away and get away from predators and all that. And if you ever do need to intervene, um, obviously, if you ever find a wild animal with obvious signs of illness or injury, so any blood, broken bones, um, conjunctivitis, so like eye discharge or nasal discharge, anything like that. Always, always, always feel free to bring them to Project Wildlife and just remember the following safety tips when you are intervening and containing wildlife. Use extreme caution when attempting to capture wildlife. Each wild animal has their own specific defense mechanism, so make sure you keep that in mind and think of that if you're ever needing to contain a wild animal. Um, they're typically stressed and fearful. If they're injured, they might be in a lot of pain and they will try to defend themselves. So if you are trying to contain a raptor fledgling, just keep an eye out for those talons and that hooked beak. Or if you're ever containing an opossum, you know, like they do still have those sharp teeth as well. So just making sure you're protecting yourself first and foremost. Never touch a wild animal with your bare hands. They can have fleas or mites or other external parasites and always use gloves, a towel, or some type of barrier when attempting to restrain wildlife. I always say use both, use towel and gloves, um, keeps you way safer, and it's a towel goes a long way with wildlife. Keep them contained in a box with air holes, and then once they're in that box, you wanna make sure you keep them warm, dark, and quiet until they're able to get to Project Wildlife. Don't give them any food, water, or medicine. I know this one's kind of counterintuitive. You want to offer them a little bowl of water. You want to offer them a little bit of cat kibble or something to tide them over. They're totally okay without food and water until they come to Project Wildlife, and it could ultimately do more harm than good. A lot of wild animals have very specific diets, and we want to make sure that they are eating what they need to eat and offering water. If they're injured or sick, they could actually drown themselves in a water dish. So we just wanna make sure we're being better safe than sorry and just keeping them contained in a box with no other external factors just so they can make sure they're as safe as possible until we can get our hands on them. Bring the animal to us within two days of capturing them. Keeping them beyond 48 hours is illegal. So California has the Good Samaritan Law, where if you do find a wild animal, you have 48 hours to get them to a licensed rehab facility. With that being said, the sooner you can get them to us, the better. And wildlife rehab every second truly does count, just to make sure we can get them all the help they need as quickly as possible. And if you're ever unsure if an animal needs to come into us or you need assistance capturing the animal, please always feel free to call us for help. Our humane law enforcement officers, once again, they're trained to go out on wildlife calls and our dispatchers and resource center are trained on knowing when people need to intervene. And we actually have a chat with them. So Project Wildlife staff are able to get in touch with them very quickly to provide advice or even give a call back if need be to help guide you through what to do. And now we'll go over a few more ways to coexist. 
never approach wildlife. They can carry diseases or try to defend themselves if they feel threatened or have young. Never feed wildlife and try your best to keep pet food indoors. If you have a dog that will only eat in your backyard or community cats that you feed, I just recommend feeding them at a set time for a limited amount of time. So put it out for an hour in the morning and an hour at night, give them the opportunity to eat and then bring it in so you're not attracting any wildlife to your yard that will ultimately rely on you for food. We don't want that. And be aware of baby season and potential den or nest sites. So it is illegal to alter or mess with any active nests in California. So just make sure we're not trimming trees that nests could possibly be in, et cetera, during that baby season time period, because we want to make sure that those babies and that mom have a chance to grow up and go and be a bird out in the wild. Always keep pets on a leash when outside. This prevents so many dog catching wildlife scenarios. We've had so many people bring in opossums that they say they were taking their dog on a hike and their dog was off leash and it just ran off into the bushes and then came back with an opossum in its mouth. So if that dog would have been on a leash, that would have been completely avoidable. Dispose of all trash properly and ensure that garbage cans are securely closed. And if problems persist with wildlife, use humane methods for wildlife removal. Never poison or try to injure them. So rodenticides and other poisons will actually travel up the food chain into the predators that ingest those rodents. And so we're ultimately harming raptors as well as the rodents that we're trying to get rid of. So there's definitely um, tips and tricks on our website to humanely um, kind of encourage wildlife to move on. And if you ever find a sick, injured, or orphaned wild animal, bring them to Project Wildlife. Again, we have our two locations. Our Gain Street location is open every day, Monday through Sunday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And our Ramona location is open every day from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And remember, if you do catch a wild animal that needs to come into us until you get them to us, please just remember to keep them warm, dark, and quiet. We call those the golden rules of wildlife rehab, and it goes a long way. So thank you so much for watching. Does anyone have any questions? So Heather, going into, I know this is a sticky one. Um, what about feeding birds, squirrels? Feeding birds and squirrels? Mm -hmm. You know, because we always say don't feed wildlife and you're not supposed to feed wildlife, but many of us they sell bird feeders, mm -hmm. grown up feeding the birds. Yeah, so with that one, I do talk to people about that. And um, there is technically a law in the state of California that feeding wildlife is illegal on any level. So like even hummingbird feeders are technically illegal. But I do call it kind of like a jaywalking law where no one's going to enforce it. So with that, you just need to make sure that you are cleaning them consistently. And also I tell people, if you're going to put out a bird seed feeder, you can't be mad when the squirrels or the rodents show up to also eat those, that food that you're offering. Um, but in general, I just say it's better to let them find their own food because again, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, just because you really love wildlife and you love seeing them in your yard doesn't mean your neighbor would and they could take some drastic measures to try to get rid of the wildlife as well. So it's always better to just kind of let them pass through on their own accord and always find their own food sources. Um, Heather, are, do we track um, when animals are released? Is there any way to track um, their survival rate after we release? So with most of the species, no, we don't have any sort of tracking for them. There's so many of them, like I said, 10 to 13,000 patients a year. We wouldn't um, realistically be able to keep track of all those patients being released. However, working with Department of Fish and Wildlife, when we do release the larger apex predators like the black bears or the mountain lions, they usually do have tracking collars on them that we're able to keep track of them after the fact. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute or to put it in chat. And this doesn't have to be, if you have any question about wildlife or the work that Project Wildlife is doing, this is your time to ask. Feel free to do so. I was going to. Uh, 
Hi, this is Susan Van Veen. I just need to mute myself for a minute. I, a, a couple years ago, there was a, um, a fledgling morning dove out on my courtyard, right on the doormat. And of course, I immediately, my immediate response was, oh my God, I have to get this to Project Wildlife. But then luckily, I went on the website and there was all the information about, no, just wait, mom and dad are around somewhere. And sure enough, within a few hours, he was gone. So I think the information on the website's very helpful for people like me who didn't know what to do at that that's time. That's awesome. I'm glad that the information was helpful. Yay. Thank you for that, Susan. Yeah, I do. I tell people that too, you know, and giving our um, resource center a call, they can help you through things as well. Um, great presentation. Everyone's giving you thank yous. Thank you. There thank you all for oh, joining us. You did want to talk about avian flu a little bit. Remember, we were going to just uh -huh. kind of give a brief update on where we're at with that or where we feel we're at with that. Yeah, so um, it's definitely still out there. There have been less positive tests, um, but also similar to what happened during COVID. I think they're also testing less of the, sus the suspicious um, species that they do get. However, right now we're still kind of holding steady and waiting through the season just because with the northern migration coming through we're not really sure if it's going to come through in another wave or where we're at with that so um it's definitely still out there so please if you have chickens or ducks or anything like that at home please continue to be diligent and making sure that you're keeping them safe and the um wild animals around you safe as well cleaning out water dishes and water bowls pretty regularly because the avian flu is definitely still out there we're just kind of going we're waiting to see how bad it's going to get after this northern migration finally makes their way through so vicky's just a reminder on where to go in north county so you can take um animals to our oceanside campus or escondido campus um, we're open Tuesday through Sunday, uh, 10 to 6 p.m. If you and again, if they're birds, we would rather them go to Ramona or to um, San Diego. But any of the other animals that we've been talking about today can be taken to um, our Oceanside or Escondido campus or some other uh, vet clinics um, that participate with us, which you know our resource center could direct you to. Um, also, if you are uncomfortable in handling um, an injured animal, uh, please call our dispatch line and our humane law officer, depending on the situation, may be able to come and pick up the animal. Every time I go to do a tour um, over at the body center, um, there's always a humane law officer bring, bringing an animal in. So they do go out as one of their, um, I think, highest call mm -hmm. volume calls. Yes, they do. So from North County, it's about the same to drive to Body or Ramona, but the drive to Ramona is beautiful. Yes, it is. It is very beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. I know everyone wants to tour and it's not tourable, um, but it is a lovely place. I do find it very peaceful when I go there. So we are, so San Diego Humane Society is its own organization. So every humane society in the United States is run autonomously. Um, we just happen to have five campuses here in San Diego. And um, those campuses are Ramona for wildlife, El Cajon, Escondido, Oceanside, and San Diego for companion animals. And again, wildlife when, when needed, we're there. They aren't cared for there. Um, they're only cared for in Ramona and in San Diego, um, but you can again drop off injured wildlife. Um, we aren't, you often see us working with the Humane Society of the United States or PETA or the ASPCA, but um, we are all our own individual organizations, but you might see us partnering and you might see us partnering here locally too with a lot of the different uh, humane societies. And then just to clarify, the El Cajon campus does not take wildlife drop-offs. It's the oh, only- Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. It's okay because at that point, it's we're just pretty close to the San Diego campus. And so the wildlife should come directly to us. Okay, if no one has any other questions, um, thank you all for coming. Amelia will be sending you a follow-up email with the recording. 
And feel free to reach out to Heather or to Amelia if you like, oh, I have a question. You can always reply back to that um, email, that follow-up email. Um, and Amelia can get that answer for you all, okay? Oh, do we have another talk coming up? Um, you are too. I think we have one coming up in September from Andy. And what are we talking about, do you remember? <laughs> I either want to say coyotes or or bears. Okay. Well, we'll so have a apex predator. predator. <laughs> Wake up with wildlife coming up in September. So be on the lookout on um, either via email or on social media. We'll be letting y'all know. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, Bye. for joining.